safety and goodness for us and our loved ones. I am very delighted to be the host of our sixth Business Outlook session. We started this program in 2016, and it's been a it, it's it's allowed us every year to be able to effectively plan and look out for what the new year pertains for us and particularly for each and every one of us as, as heads of small and growing businesses across Nigeria. Our uh, Outlook session this year has been jointly organized by the Faith Foundation Management Team in collaboration with the Faith Alumni Executive Committee members. And we have quite a number of our Executive Committee members already here and we'll be introducing them at the end of the program. The Faith Foundation alumni community is made up of graduates from our full-time flagship programs, namely the Aspiring Entrepreneurs Program, the Emerging Entrepreneurs Program, the Orange Corners Program, the Institute for Venture Design, and the Scale Up Lab Accelerator Program. I am very proud to note that we now have over 6,000 alumni members who are present in 24 states across Nigeria and in all sectors of the Nigerian community. And we can see that uh, we, we already have people from Lagos, Abuja, and different states across the country introducing themselves. So I would like to warmly welcome all our alumni members. As Fatai has said, please, can you go and tell all your alumni groups in all our different, particularly our WhatsApp groups, to please come and join in uh, and start the conversation. This is not a conversation to come in late into. This is a conversation where we want to all start from the beginning and fully engage to the end. And also please, as we're all doing, as you come in, please introduce yourself, your business, where you're based, where you're from, and welcome each and every one of us. So thank you once again. Um, we have on the conversation today, our the president of our alumni association, Mr. Max Venkiti, who will be co-hosting this session with me, and I'll be introducing him at the Q&A time. So thank you once again. We started planning this program in November 2020 with the Alumni Executive Committee. It was a bit of different planning this year, because usually when, we do, when we've done the previous sessions, we'll, have, we'll start the planning December, then we'll do the session January, February. But last year almost felt like every year we were re-strategizing, we were trying to re-understand the involving pandemic and the impact on our various businesses and our various sectors. So when we this when we're deliberating on the conversations for today, uh, it was very clear that we also needed to make it pertinent, focused, and very relevant to 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 in a, in such a way that will address the needs of our wide and diverse um, community segment. It really was a challenging year. A lot in part for a lot of our business men and women. Uh, particularly with for those in sectors that were impacted uh, by the pandemic and the lockdowns that followed after. Um, but it was also a year where quite a number of alumni members also found different opportunities to either expand, evolve, um, diversify their businesses, or even for some of those who are in critical sectors um, of the economy, there are some, there are some businesses that we even saw that grew um, even during the pandemic. As we reviewed the focus themes and the topic for the outlook for today's session, it was clear that we needed to focus not just on reviewing the macroeconomic outlook for 2021, as we had done in previous years, but also look at some key regulations and policy opportunities locally, regional, regionally, and globally that could present key opportunities for all our businesses to take advantage of. And so that is why our conversations today will be reviewing on a very high level, the macroeconomic outlook, the African continental free trade area, and also discussing resilient strategies in planning for 2021. That's the year we are in. We have selected three experts who will be taking on these three focus areas and sharing their insights and thoughts for our consideration. I will be formally introducing them just before they come up to speak, but I would like to first of all say thank you to the, to the three of them who said yes to us as soon as we reached out to them and we invited them. They're all set, they're on the call and they're waiting to share with each and every one of us. Just before we formally start the program, I would like to briefly run through the agenda and what to expect. Um, as soon as I finish my introduction, I will be inviting uh, Taiwo Yidele, to come and speak on the macroeconomic outlook for micro, small, and medium enterprises in 2021. 
Shortly after his presentation, we would have Yewande Sadiku, who will speak on the opportunities uh, for Nigerian businesses presented by the African Continental Free Trade Area. Our third speaker, Ola Brown, will speak on resilience building strategies for Nigerian entrepreneurs um, in 2020. And right after that, we're going to have an interactive Q&A session with our virtual audience, which will be moderated by Max Menkiti, the president of our alumni executive committee. And once we do that, we will excuse our three guests and then we'll move on to alumni conversations and alumni matters. And we will round up these conversations formally at one o'clock. So that's really the high, uh, the high level agenda and the flow of our event. In terms of housekeeping, as we've done, please feel free to use the chat box for our conversations to introduce yourselves and to also share comments and highlights from the conversations. However, please note that we would only be taking questions using the Q and A box. So we have the Q and A box that is there. Please use that to put your questions, make them brief, straight to the point, if you want to specifically direct them to any particular panelist, please do that and indicate the panelist you or the speaker rather that you would like to have to address your questions. So succinct so straight to the point and put your questions there and only in the Q&A box. We will not be taking any audio or video questions. So I know there's a raise hand feature, but we won't be able to, we would not be using the raise hand feature for this conversation. Questions will only be taken by text in the Q&A section on the box. So now that my introduction is complete, I would like to introduce our first speaker uh, for today's session. Let me quickly share my screen. Our first speaker for today's session is Taiwo Ayodele. Taiwo Ayodele um, is a partner within PwC Nigeria. And he joined PwC as an associate in 2002 and had the fastest growing career progression uh, within a, a modern accounting firm um, to in, in the last couple of years, as we know, I became a partner under eight years. Um, I, I worked with, with a big four and I know that that really is an amazing and if not an impossible fit. So we know that we really have somebody who is very well experienced and, and, and an expert who is going to speak to us. He's currently the West Africa tax leader and a member of PwC's Global Board for Leadership Development and also the chairman for PwC Nigeria's Ethics Committee. Taiwo is a fellow of the Nigerian Leadership Initiative and a member of the Corporate Governance Society. And he holds different roles across different organizations, including ICANN. Um, he's, a, he's the research director and fiscal commissioner for the Nigerian Economic Summit Group uh, Fiscal Policy Roundtable. He's a member of the Ministerial Committee on the Implementation of Nigeria's National Tax Policy. And he's also a member of the ACCA Global Governing Council. Is alumnus of various leading um, global and international business schools and the founder and president of Impact Africa Foundation, and also a guest lecturer at the University of Lagos, Babcock University, and the Lagos Business School. Uh, so please join me as I hand over to Taiwo Oyedele, who will be sharing with us the macroeconomic outlook for Nigeria's micro, small, and medium enterprises in 2021. Um, over to you, Ty. Um, sorry, for the Faith Foundation team, there's something showing. I don't know why we have that showing on the screen. Um, OK, so thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Ty. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for the opportunity and for the invitation. I need to commend. Uh, Faith Foundation for the excellent work you're doing. Um, and also thank you for the very warm uh, introduction. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now. Um, okay, so if you can just confirm when you're able to see my screen. Yes, we can, we can. Thank you very much. Let me try and do slideshow. Um, 
You're on mute, please. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for letting me know. Um, I'll do the slide view as we go along as soon as I have the button to do that, so apologies. So what I'm gonna be speaking to us in the limited time that I have today uh, is in terms of the macroeconomic outlook, uh, especially how these affect uh, MSMEs in 2021. Uh, so the outline of my presentation will be essentially uh, to have an overview of the uh, MSME sector, as well as the Nigerian economy for 2020. And uh, so that way we have some background. And then we move on to uh, macroeconomic insights and outlook. We then look at the implications for MSMEs in 2021. And then I'll share some useful tips and concluding uh, thoughts uh, for us. Okay, overview of the economy uh, essentially is, is not to tell us all the complicated stuff and, and the things that make people worry too much um, about the economy, but really about showing us what are the issues and is there anything we can do about them and what are the key learnings that we can all take from these issues uh, that happened in 2020 and how do we expect this to shape uh, what happens going forward. So um, the macroeconomic indices, uh, of course, we know COVID-19 happened and then complicated everything. We didn't have a scenario for it. We had no plan for it. Uh, and so it was difficult for everyone uh, to try and uh, focus on what we had initially planned. Uh, we had issues with foreign exchange, Naira devalued, because we're not making money from foreign direct investments. The flow of foreign portfolio investment also reduced as well as diaspora remittances, high inflation. But the good news is Nigeria ended the year, still the largest economy in Africa and moved up to 26 globally, according to the IMF. In the area of monetary policies, um, you know, there's a lot to talk about there from Naira devaluation to CBM policies, introducing restrictions here and there. But also good news is we had the, perhaps one of the lowest interest rate regimes uh, in Nigeria in many years, uh, in 2020. So that meant more opportunities for businesses to borrow, at least at more affordable rate than previously as well as um, the fact that that meant we have some, you know, increased activities in the capital market as people were looking for yield. In the area of fiscal policy, issues were mostly driven by COVID-19, expectedly, and government came out with the economic sustainability plan. Um, the lawmakers wanted to introduce an economic stimulus law, but they were not successful. And then there was the conversation about PIB, and that continues until 2021 now. So the good news again is in all of this, um, we had quick actions by the uh, authorities, executive and the National Assembly in passing the budget, including even the revisions that they have to do, as well as enacting the Finance Act of 2020, in addition to other major reforms like the new CAMA in 2020. So in terms of other highlights, we all know the issues we contend with in terms of insecurity, uh, we had the, you know, the civil unrest, the strikes by all manners of uh, organizations and, and, and labor bodies. Uh, border closure was open towards the end of the year. AFTCA was supposed to take effect in 2020, it had to be postponed till the beginning of 2021. Uh, and then but the good news again is the Nigeria Stock Exchange ranked the world best performing capital market in 2020. So at the end of the day, no matter how bleak or difficult the environment is, you always find the bright spots. So for the FMSME sectors, uh, what I talk to do is just to share like 10 important facts with us. Uh, some of these you would already know. 
Uh, Nigeria has about 41.5 million MSMEs. That's according to the MBS and Smenda. Interestingly, over 99% of them are micro businesses, really very tiny businesses. These are businesses where the owners will tell you, we're just, we just the hustle, you know, which means less than 400,000 are really SMEs because majority are micro businesses. Out of the SMEs, 23% of SME owners are female and 77% are male. 7.6% of SMEs are involved in exports. So if you are not exporting and your business has the opportunity and the potential for exports, you're missing something because some are already doing it. Many SMEs don't survive up to five years. The major reason is lack of business management skills. So congratulations again to those who have gone through this program of Faith Foundation and that are here today because it means you value knowledge and this is priceless actually. Majority of SME owners learn by making all possible mistakes by themselves. Now, this is the most expensive way to learn in the world. It's more expensive than going to Harvard or going to Yale or any of these top schools uh, because some of these mistakes, people don't recover from them. So rather, what you should do is learn from others um, rather than make all the mistakes by yourself. 14% of SMEs are registered as private limited liability companies. 73% operate as sole proprietorship. Others are partnership, cooperatives, and the other forms. Uh, so this also shows you that there's a big opportunity for SME owners to formalize their businesses so they are able to scale up better and they are able to take advantage of opportunities. And Kama 2020 actually makes it even more attractive now, as well as the various uh, reforms by government in the area of taxes such that uh, owning a limited liability company now gives you more advantages than running your business as an enterprise uh, without incorporation at the Corporate Affairs Commission. According to Smedan and the MBS, uh, Nigeria's SMEs contribute nearly 50% of the country's GDP and account for over 80% of employment. Um, sadly, what I notice in Nigeria is that everybody talks about SMEs, but not everybody is sincere about it. I think many people, especially policymakers, just say because everybody is talking about it, it's huge, it seems like the right thing to focus on, but in terms of really doing what needs to move the needle, we don't see much actions in that space. The most pressing, uh, and these data are a combination of data from Smedan, um, rough statistics, and then a study conducted by PwC um, recently. So the most pressing business challenges facing SMEs are finding fund, that's finance, finding customer, that's really about sales, and then infrastructure. The biggest cost for many SMEs is power generation. Can you imagine? So biggest cost for most SMEs is electricity. And that's because a lot of it is self-generated, followed by rent, then followed by cost of capital, and then staff cost is even number four. So which means we spend a lot of money on so many things. So I thought to include an extra from uh, the study we conducted to show you, you know, what are the issues that SMEs are facing. And I'm sure many of us on this call can relate uh, to these issues uh, in different dimensions. It may be that number one for you is not number one for many people, but these issues uh, tend to cause across, cut across. Uh, and you also see the biggest cost there. Um, taxes is there. Some of the issues are also to do with uh, finding the right workforce. Sometimes it's not even finding people with the right skills. It's just finding people who are just honest. It's so difficult in Nigeria uh, to find people you can rely on. Sometimes it doesn't matter how much you pay them. Uh, and this makes it even a lot more difficult for small businesses. So having said that, let's quickly look at the macroeconomic insights and outlook for 2021. I know these are big grammars that economists uh, speak. Uh, but if I want to simplify it, I'll just say macroeconomics is really talking about what are those big issues that government is this really about the actions of governments that impact the wider economy. So when we say micro, it means what you are doing as an individual, you know, what the private sector is doing, what businesses are doing for themselves. Now, 
a, a very big component of government actions and, and an indication of government priorities is, is the budget. It shows you what government is trying to focus on. And I have the summary there and I won't go through the details uh, because that's not the focus for today. But it's instructive to note that our deficit for 2021 as planned in this budget is the highest in our history, at least in nominal terms. So what that means is government will then go into you know, creative ways to try and bridge uh, that gap, including asking the CBN to technically print money for government to spend, selling public assets uh, to gain efficiency and to raise money. And of course, the government will want to collect taxes. So let's be honest about it. So but if I want to outline some of the key issues uh, in Nigeria, uh, regionally and then across the globe, um, I, I thought to give a list of 10. I think 10 is always a good number. So um, for COVID-19, uh, it's still here with us. Oil price outlook is clouded by COVID-19 induced uncertainties. What that means is we can we can place a bet about where Naira exchange rate is going, for example. And that affects many businesses, especially those who rely on imports. Um, and it's almost impossible to find a business in Nigeria who has no components of their businesses um, you know, that, is, that is imported. It may be the equipment you use, when you want to replace those equipment, the price is like over the road. The Finance Act 2020 introduced a lot of key reforms. Uh, I'll come back to that in a little while. Uh, then we have the budget. Uh, I mentioned that already in terms of how do we fund our budget deficit? Uh, you expect government to spend more in a period where they expect to collect less. So that means the deficit is, is much higher. In the area of monetary policy, uh, we expect that Naira is likely to, to depreciate for that. Um, we're not trying to carry bad news, we're just seeing the reality. And this has also been forecasted by uh, other reputable organizations, including the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, we expect that there will be a little bit more convergence in terms of the various windows. Someone like me and many analysts believe that if we can have a unified rate, it will solve a lot of our problems. But it takes a lot of political will to be able to do that. Uh, Nigeria has, has made policy commitments to the IMF because we borrowed money from them, uh, pressure from the World Bank, and we expect this to influence the trend of particularly monetary policy, but also fiscal policy in 2021. In the area of business regulation, we see the new karma, and the CAC has now introduced Companies Regulation 2020, um, and that's for them to implement the new karma effectively from January this year. And they adopted technology, uh, including what we call extensible business reporting language. And what this will do is, once this is properly done, every company and businesses in Nigeria registered with the CAC we have a single source of truth for the account. So you will need to give a bank another account when you're applying for a loan. But it also means that for those who are not honest, the opportunity to pre prepare three versions of accounts will be a thing of the past. Overall, we expect there should be ease of doing business. Security, it's there. Um, we hope, we pray, we take actions, and, and we're hoping for the best. Across the region, the African continental free trade area will play the biggest role in terms of what we expect in 2021, although it will be unrealistic to think that Africa will take off fully uh, in just one year. It will take time, but the journey has started. Uh, on the global stage, we have Brexit. Um, you know, ironically, as Nigeria and the rest of Africa were coming together under Africa on the 1st of January, uh, you know, UK was leaving the EU, and some people were saying, "Is there something they they saw that we're not seeing?" I think personally that the you know the British made a mistake, but it's their decision. Uh, across the world, Brexit, Joe Biden, and the US and the rest of us would influence what we see. So trade policies across the world affect every country, uh, but we expect there will be less tension now with Joe Biden, uh, who is um, more you know without sounding political. Uh, who is more decent uh, than the previous president. Uh, recession, we expect that there will be recovery before the end of the year. Uh, it may be Q2, maybe Q3 or Q4, but we think that it will happen. But more importantly, how can we make that recovery inclusive and how can we build back better so we don't leave uh, the vulnerable people behind? 
So in terms of implications for SMSMEs in 2021, now that we've set all those contexts about the macroeconomic space, about the overview of the MSME sector, um, I thought to just put them again under four broad headings. So there will be challenges in 2021. So we can pray, we can fast, we can hope, we can be positive, but the reality is that there will be challenges Unfortunately, COVID-19 crossover also to 2021. We're hoping we could leave it behind right? so it will go with 2020. But here is the stubborn COVID-19. It's here with us. And what that means is the uncertainties continue. Nobody knows how vaccines will play out. Nobody knows second wave what it, it means. And nobody knows whether there'll be other variants that the vaccines cannot control or whether there'll be a third wave. It's uncertain. Uh, so we, we should you know, accept that. But then we can do something about it in terms of how we plan, in terms of how we are prepared, uh, in, terms of, in terms of our mindsets, you know, even just following those protocols, uh, you know, issued by government, it's extremely important. Yesterday now, a new regulation has been issued and people can go to jail uh, for not wearing face masks. Whether that's effective, whether it's the right thing to do, we can debate it, but the reality is we all have to start uh, playing our, our, our bit. Uh, what that means also is that for your business, if you expect high cost of doing business, uh, government is looking for money. So what that means is we've seen removal of subsidy on, on fuel products. Uh, we see the ongoing debates around the price of electricity uh, in terms of electricity tariff. So you see more of this coming across plus the exchange rate uh, of the Naira making importation higher it means that your cost of doing business will be higher uh, in 2021. Uh, with insecurity, harsh operating environment, and infrastructure that is not where it should be, it's not going to be fixed in one year. We will not suddenly have good roads everywhere, 24-7 electricity, so the challenges will persist. But opportunities are bound. In fact, one way to look at it is the more problems there are in an environment, the more the opportunities to create solutions and make money doing so. Uh, there are more problems to solve in Nigeria, for example, and there are problems in, say, the U.S. So for an entrepreneur, a business owner, that mindset of thinking of how can I solve a problem in my own little way and then make money in the process is really what opportunities are all about. To be able to identify this, self-development is key. You need to keep an open mind, reinvent yourself, position yourself, and maintain a healthy network of contact. This is not the time to keep everybody, uh, you know, be, if you're too concerned about how many people are following you here and there, especially on social media, it's a waste of time. You should focus on the quality of your network, not the quantity of it. Uh, so you're better off having 10 people who mean well for you, who can share you know, good insight with you and point you in the right direction and mentor you. Some of your mentors, you don't need to know them. They don't need to know you. Uh, rather, you need to know them maybe virtually, uh, but not not one-on-one, -on -one, and you can learn from them. So commit to doing the right thing. Integrity is critical to business sustainability. If you want to go fast uh, in business and make, you know, like they say in Nigeria, if you want to blow, you can afford to tell lies, but you can bear that will be for a short while. If you are building for the long term a sustainable business, then integrity is extremely important. You need to commit to excellence and continuously seek feedback and find ways to get better. Why this is even important is COVID-19 um, is forcing many people, including businesses that were not previously online, to go online. Now, the more you move online, the more difficult it is for you. In fact, it's almost impossible to erase the trail, uh, the footprint you leave behind. So which means authorities have better opportunities now and access to information about what you're doing. Uh, many of us remember Legal State did uh, register to open. You know, the information they collected is it's stuck somewhere. So some of the people who registered to open were just so eager to open, they had not even thought about the fact that they never registered to pay personal income tax with Legal State. So now we have NIN, right? NIN simply means that government is connecting, you know, you with everything about you, uh, linking to your phone number, to your bank account. Someone can just call up your NIN and see everything about you. So really, you should want to do the right thing rather than trying to do hide and seek.
And last thing, but not the least, is technology will continue to be a game changer uh, in 2021 and even beyond. There's technology and intelligence uh, that people are using now to create new business opportunities and for some to do what they are currently doing, but do it differently. Uh, sometimes it's to do it better. Uh, your digital footprint matters. So even though we're, we're saying keep social distance, I always like to say it's physical distance that you're supposed to keep. It can be socially connected. So keep your connection with your customers, keep your connections with your suppliers, uh, with regulators, uh, with you know everybody, uh, even your staff. So stay connected. This is the time to be very connected, not only locally. The good thing with you know technology is you now have the opportunity to be connected with anyone and everyone that you want across the world. Uh, explore technology uh, opportunities in the area of virtual offering. Are there things you're doing that you can do better by offering them virtually? Digital marketing, and the list is long. But if you are not very competent, not competent actually, I'll say if you're not comfortable with technology, you're missing out a huge opportunity in 2021 and going forward. So how will the changes affect MSMEs in 2021? Apart from what I've said, I thought to quickly share this on the finance side because I see majority of small business owners don't know. And if you don't know, you can't take advantage of the opportunities. The Finance Act of 2019 exempted small businesses from paying company income tax, from charging VAT, so you don't have to charge VAT on your goods and services, but small business is only 25 million turnover or less in a year. Uh, over 600 basic food items were, uh, were exempted from VAT uh, in 2019 Finance Act. Then the 2020 Finance Act signed on the 31st of December last year, now built on those reliefs, including now minimum wage earners. So anybody who earns 30,000 Naira or less does not have to pay past income tax. So as a business owner, you don't have to deduct PAYE. Some people said to me, but these people were not paying the taxes before anyway. And I said, yeah, that's true for many of them. But here is the problem. When the tax authorities come to the business owner, they'll just tell you you have not been complying. Now, that gives them the opportunity to exploit those small business owners. And sometimes the liabilities are overstated and exaggerated so that they can uh, set to them. So we have exemption from education tax, reduce import duty and levy on vehicles. Uh, flight tickets are exempted from VAT for those of, of us who fly. There are incentives now for agreed businesses, including pioneer of up to, pioneer status means you don't pay income tax for six years, of up to uh, six years. Uh, expansion of tax base, uh, using tax intelligence and technology already uh, spoke to that before. So as I close, uh, just be mindful of the time that I have left. I have some tips around business goals, around financial management, around tax efficiency. And I'll not go through them. I know you have these slides at the end of the conference and you can always reference them uh, whenever you need to. But one thing I just need to mention is the importance of knowledge. Don't get into something that you don't fully understand. Uh, it's difficult to make money, but it's so easy to lose the money that you make. So people will come to you with cryptocurrency, trading in FX, they say now it is gold, another time is something else. Focus on your area of competence and knowledge and your business. It's okay to look for other sources of, of income, but make sure it's something you fully understand. Uh, you don't want to sweat it out and then lose the money overnight. Uh, really, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not the right thing to do. And you know, again, focus on people. You need to stay safe, keep your people safe as well. Your customers are king, but your employees are the king makers. So if you treat your employees well, even though many of us will feel like some of the employees don't deserve it because you know some of them are really just not honest. Uh, but you have to still treat them well so they can treat your customers well, and then that way your business can grow. I have other tips here as well, uh, and, and these tips are based on the study we conducted that I told you about earlier on around what are the key issues facing small businesses and what can be done about those challenges. So I close now with this uh, slide. Um, <clears throat> and first is the image you have to the left of the screen. And there are just two guys talking about you know, issues of life. 
uh, with particular focus on COVID. And the big guy said, COVID or no COVID, one day we will all die, almost giving up on life. And the other guy said, true, but on all the other days, we will not. Uh, and this is really about, uh, is it half full or is it half empty when you're looking at your cup? So I always want to see life as half full, which means uh, that positive mindset and perspective, uh, being mindful. So this is not being naive and, and hope that everything will work well. Things will not all work well. That's the reality. Uh, but having a positive mindset makes you better prepared, uh, not only to face the challenges, but to take advantage of the opportunities. Uh, as business managers, you should be mi mindful of those challenges and be open still to the opportunities. Your opportunities now are no longer limited to uh, your small area or even your state or your country. Your opportunities now are global. Uh, and they're also regional as well. And I know we're gonna be speaking about one of the speakers who talked about Africa uh, later on. So it, it, my closing quote is Martin Luther King Jr. who said, we must accept finite disappointment but we must never lose infinite hope. So of course, um, anybody who is in business in Nigeria would know that you just can't afford to lose hope. Uh, you have to keep moving, you have to keep learning, and you have to keep getting better. And so thank you very much for paying attention to me. Thank you very much, Tayo. Thank you very, very much. Um, that was a good uh, context setting for our conversation. Um, I know you're definitely going to have a lot of questions because we can see that, particularly the questions around um, some of the reliefs you spoke about from the finance and the karma um, acts that were passed and um, even things around tax and regulation. So I can see a few questions already in the Q&A segment for that, but thank you very much. Um, you gave a lot of highlights in terms of a lot of times some of us will, be, will tend to look at last year as a gloomy year, but um, even despite that, you touched about some of the highlights for Nigeria as a country in itself, looking at our stock exchange, even our economy in terms of the, still being the largest in Africa and 26 in the world. Um, we also, one of the good things that happened was the budget was passed before the end of the year. Um, and then some of the highlights around the new provisions in Kama, in the Finance Act, that are specifically also targeted at uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises that we can take advantage of. Uh, you also spoke about some of the implications from things we're seeing globally. So whether looking at Brexit or whether looking at um, even the incoming Biden administration from the US and, and how everything is evolving in terms of policies towards Africa and towards Nigeria, and also towards even encouraging and nurturing and entrepreneurship. And then last, I think for not the least, one of the things you talked also about was around technology and the need to really just focus, look around the evolution of technology, not just from the aspect of um, us adapting uh, relevant technology to, to enable us to grow and to be much more efficient, but even how regulatory oversights uh, are also employing technology to have uh, much more oversight around how businesses, from whether businesses are from the registration process all through the regulatory overview and oversight process. So I know that we'll also have quite a lot of questions um, asking you to elaborate more around the Finance Act and some of these additional provisions and how people can take advantage of them, but also how people can ensure that they also don't um, get penalized for things that uh, we should know about. So thank you once again, and we look forward to having you join us in the Q&A session. One of the things that um, you spoke about during your, your uh, session was the after, and I am, I am going to use that as a segue to invite our next speaker uh, who will speak on that. Our next speaker um, is Yewande Sadiku, and Yewande is the executive secretary and chief executive officer of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission, which is Nigeria's foremost investment promotion agency. Um, up until October 2016, she was the executive director at Stambic IBTC Group's corporate and investment banking business, ensuring the realization of business opportunities in Nigeria's complex operating environment. 
Her career spans over 23 years and she has handled assignments in virtually every sector of the Nigerian economy and providing advice to quite a lot of diverse corporates locally and internationally too. She's also played an active role in the development of the capital market by participating in industry committees and chairing the rules and compliance subcommittees which advise the SEC on the rules that guide the operation of Nigerians Investment Securities Act for 12 years. In other, apart from all these hats she wears, she also has an entrepreneurial hat um, and she formally financed the, um, made, played a major role in financing the Nigerian film industry and raised the funding for one of the books we're all proud of, which is Half of a Yellow Sun in 2014. She was awarded the Eisenhower Fellowships for International Leadership Program in May 2010 and has been featured as one of the 35 international women under 35 to watch in the World Business Magazine. She is going to be speaking on the opportunities that the Africa Free Trade Continental Trade Agreement presents for Nigerian businesses. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Yewande Sadiku to take on our next session. You're very welcome. Thank you. Adenike, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Good morning, all. I've been looking forward to this. I've known about Faith Foundation for many, many years, and I've interacted with many, um, many in the Faith family. But I think this is the first time that I'll be speaking to a Faith audience. Um, if you'll allow me to share my screen, I put together a few slides to help you understand the subject. So if I was sitting in a room with all of you, I would have asked you how many of you have um, read the agreement for the African continental free trade area. And what I find is that I haven't been in a room where more than a handful of hands have gone up. It's a fairly complicated um, document. The document itself actually is not complicated, but it has many annexures, attachments and the like. And the impact that it will have on our lives is material. So it is useful to understand. What I've tried to do in the following slides is to make it as um, easy to uh, digest for you as um, possible. But the first thing I'll say um, before I provide a bit more context on the, on the free trade area agreement is that we did not need an African continental free trade agreement for Nigerians to trade with Africans or for Africans to trade with themselves. The principles embedded in the African Continental Free Trade Area um, Agreement in many ways have existed in Africa for generations. That's why we have been dealing with each other, trading with each other, despite the absence of an agreement that allowed it. So what the agreement does, it provides rules of engagement, clarity as to behavior, it provides for dispute resolution if somebody falls out of line. And if trade practices are injurious, it provides for dealing with it. But it is not the agreement that will make Africa one because Africa was always and has always traded you know, with each other. But it encourages and it actively encourages for Africans to trade um, with each other. Um, the quantum of trade that we have in Africa um, is currently at 15%. If you compare it to what other continents have, in Europe, 67% of their trade is with each other. In Asia, 58% of their trade is with each other. In North America, 48% of their trade is with each other. In Africa, you know, the level is at 15%. With this free trade area agreement, it's estimated that that level you know, will um, double in time. And it is important, you know, we trade with each other because it helps improve our common wealth and our common economic prospects. If you think about the faith family and faith instituting that if you want to buy any goods or services, first check if somebody in the faith family has that item before you go outside. You know, it will help all of us up our game and it will help all of us um, progress. But essentially that is what the agreement was established to do. Creating a single market that is the largest in the world for the free movement of goods, of services, and of people. 
Ultimately, it is aimed at improving Africa's competitiveness. The more we do with ourselves, the better we get at it, the more you know, ready we will be for them trading with the rest of the world. Um, when Nigeria did not sign the agreement uh, when, it was, when it was signed in 2018, the rest of the world you know, was surprised that Nigeria took that position uh, for good reason. Um, in terms of giving you historical context, it was actually Nigeria's um, prime minister, um, Sir Tafawa Balewa, that asked, suggested in 1963 that Africa should operate as a single market. So Nigeria's leaders, you know, had such a vision that they foresaw that the continent should come together, you know, to trade as one. And then several years later in Lagos, an action plan for the adoption of that vision, um, you know, uh, was, was, was signed. The Abuja Treaty, 11 years after that, again in Nigeria, you know, then formed economic communities. There were eight economic communities, including, including ECOWAS that were created at the time. But the object of this was to lead us towards this AFCFTA, which was then, you know, eventually signed in 2018, Nigeria joined in July 2019, and you know, trading uh, was expected to begin in 2021. As Taiwo said, even though you know, the agreement has been signed, trading has begun, in reality, it will not happen overnight. Um, it will take many years to get there. And what the agreement um, proposes is that by 2031, 90% of the duty Sorry, the duty on 90% of tariff lines in customs unions should be removed. I'll explain what that is. When you talk about trade, there's trade in goods, which is what most of us think of as trade, the tangible things that we buy and sell from each other, but there's also trade in services. When a lawyer, a teacher, um, a tech expert, you know, provides their services in other markets. It's also deemed as trade, although it is trade in a service rather than trade in goods. But the objective of the trade in goods component is to achieve what I will loosely call the 90-10 rule. It's the progressive elimination of tariff, that's duties that are attached when you're trading goods across borders, and non-tariff barriers, such as measures that are instituted that don't relate to the payment of you know, duties or tariffs, but are aimed at discouraging you know, a, a set or a universe from participating. Um, but the ultimate object is to develop a capacity for regional and continental value chains. There, there are 5,516 lines, tariff lines that represent 90% in customs, you know, in the customs universe, 90% of the goods that generally have customs codes for trading across borders. The objective is that over five years for all countries and 10 for those in customs unit unions, that on those 90% of the tariff lines, the target is zero tariff. Now it's zero tariff over five to 10 years. It's not zero tariff from year one, it's not zero tariff from year two, but the object is over five years for all countries and 10 for those in customs unions to progressively move towards this zero tariff. Then the other 10% is in two buckets. The first bucket is what is called the sensitive list. And that sensitive list, again, is to achieve zero, uh, zero zero tariff over 10 years for all countries. And for the least developed countries, they have 13 years to achieve the objective. But then there's a 3% exclusion list. That 3% is a list that every country can decide what is on their 3% list. These are items that the country, if they want to protect, products that they consider to be strategic, they can put them in this 3% list, 184 tariff lines that the country can decide that they will not negotiate, that these ones, you know, tariffs will apply, whatever rules they decide will apply, um, but it is only for the 3%, which translates to 184 tariff lines. And the list can then be revised every um, five years. To, to give you some context, 
sorry, my system is, um, I don't know what it is doing, but it is hanging and I can't move beyond this slide. But I wanted to show you, okay. So if you just give me a minute. Um, I'll project through another, um, yeah. Fantastic. Can you see my screen now? I hope you can all see my screen now. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. So I'm showing you the, the, because there are different rules for customs that, for countries that are not in customs unions and countries that are in customs unions. So I thought I'd show you the three customs unions on the continent. ECOWAS, many of us are familiar with, the South African Customs Union, and the East African community. So these are the countries that have 10 years to liberalize the 90% of the goods, of the goods on the 90% on the of the tariff lines. Um, the other comment I find that people worry about is the readiness of African countries for AFCFT. Actually, Nigerians don't worry about the readiness of African countries. They worry simply about Nigeria's readiness for it. And my first message to you is that there isn't a single country on the continent that is fully ready. Some are more ready than others, but there isn't a single country that is fully ready. So we should be concerned that we are not ready, but we should not be, we should not lose hope because we are not fully ready because nobody is fully ready. What most countries, com countries plan to do is to use the AFCFTA as a driving force for their global trade competitiveness. From what we've seen, there are six countries on the continent, South Africa, Nigeria, Morocco, Kenya, Egypt, and Botswana, that seem within the African context to be more ready than the others. They require additional work to optimize the benefits of AFCFTA, but they certainly require less work than the rest of the countries. So we should be concerned, but we should be rest assured that Nigeria is more ready than most. Before the AFCFTA, for your goods and services, you probably thought of Nigeria and the 36 states and the FCT as the universe within which you can do business. With the AFCFTA, you now have the capacity to stretch your business aspirations imperially and look towards all of the countries on the continent. So it gives Nigerian entrepreneurs, Nigerian businesses, the capacity to look just beyond the 36 states to all of the countries on the continent. The potential opportunities and implications generally for Nigeria, as I said, Nigeria is more ready than most African countries, um, <clears throat> um, particularly in services. Nigerian companies have long developed the capacity you know, to serve the rest of the continent. And I'll give a few examples later of country companies in Nigeria that have ventured outside. Because of the large size of the Nigerian market, um, the reason that the Nigerian market can support the development um, and survival of many entrepreneurs, because of that large size of our domestic market, is what makes us the ideal gateway e e um, economy for the AFCFT. It's a potential threat as well, but what we see, what is more likely if we respond appropriately to it is that Nigeria will be a gateway rather than a target. Um, the AFCFTA, as I said, provides an expanded market for Nigerian goods and services. We see that the manufacturing value addition in Nigeria is more than seven times the average of the top 20 economies in Africa. So our manufacturing capacity is actually more developed than most. And in many ways, this agreement complements Nigeria's own aspirations for national development. 
Of course, there are challenges, some of which Taiwo spoke about, all of which all of us are aware of. And he spoke about power being the biggest challenge of um, small businesses. So the challenges with power, routes to market infrastructure, everything from roads to rail to ports, you know, security, which Taiwo also mentioned. The things essentially that can hinder our competitiveness are still threats that we need to be mindful of. So improving Nigeria's ease of doing business is even more important, even more urgent. And then the importance of, you know, the multitude of, um, the impact of the multitude of, you know, number of agreements that we've signed. But the comparative advantages that Nigeria has, I think Nigeria's locational advantage is one. I believe, and I say this all the time, I mean, from Nigeria, you can, within a six hour flying radius, just about reach anywhere in Africa. A lot of the items that Africa imports are manufactured goods, many of which are priority products for Nigeria's industrialization and economic diversification. I've talked about services, I'll talk about it again. Financial, communication, the tech-enabled ecosystem as a whole, agricultural products, whether it's food or live animals, manufactured products, and I only listed a handful of them, but they're a variety. Now, the Nigerian companies that have demonstrated that we did not need AFCFTA for them to travel, a handful of them are shown on the screen. The list, of course, is not exhaustive, but UBA is in 20 countries, Dangote is in 12, GT Bank is in 10, Glow is in five, Interswitch, Aga, a few examples. And all of us know that Nigeria's fashion, Nigeria's music, Nigeria's movies are consumed all over the continent. The response that we expect to the agreement is that people should be looking for where on the African continent to then situate to manufacture for the continent. And we believe, you know, the, the things that will continue to drive investor interest in Nigeria. Sometimes they say when Nigerians sit together, you know, we talk about this is wrong and that is wrong and this needs to be fixed and that needs to be fixed. While things need to be fixed, for many investors, what they see are the advantages that Nigeria has. And that's why Nigeria will continue to be an essential component of every Africa strategy. Some may take the view that they'd like some of the challenges dealt before they enter, but every must keep Nigeria a foresight. What investors see, what investors tell us, one of the most entrepreneurial, innovative, and ingenious economies. And I believe that when Nigerians fully understand what this agreement says and decide to take advantage of it, that if they support that with the scale of opportunities that already exist in Nigeria and the quality of the talents that we have in Nigeria, combined with the fact that Nigerians are fundamentally adaptable and agile people. You know, that this game, this competition for Africa is one, you know, that Nigerians will win. In terms of SMEs, the full implementation of the agreement, as I mentioned, should drive investment interest in Africa. So investors should be looking for the most suitable location to site their business. And part of our own job at NIPC is to help them see why Nigeria should rank high in their consideration. A lot of government efforts, and Taiwo has spoken about some of these things as well, are focused on ensuring Nigeria's attractiveness, not only as a destination, but as a, as a location for production. Three recent laws, Kama 2020, the Finance Act of 2019 and 2020, have some improvements that are aimed at helping small businesses better survive. When government engages with the private sector on this agreement that is in many ways complicated and in many ways still developing and still forming, government engagements are with the private, with the private sector are through the organized private sector. So it's chambers of commerce, it's sector associations, it's industry groups. Um, information, education, proactive engagement, with these associations and seeking expert advice are very important in understanding what the rules of you know, play are. Understanding how the items that you make, if you make a physical item, how your products relate to the 9010 rule that I talked about, whether the things that you make are on the 90 side or on the 10%. If it's on the 10%, I mean, for SMEs, it's more likely in the 90 or in the seven, but it is also possible 
that it is on the 3% sensitive list. Then there's a rule um, called the rules of origin. Because Af products made on the African continent will get preferential treatment in the rest of the continent. The rules that define what is a product or a service that comes from the African continent, they're very important for you to understand for appropriately positioning yourself. If they say, for instance, that 65% of the finished product must come from Africa, it's to ensure that the input that you use to get to the finished product meets you know, those standards. But because you will now have the capacity to sell to a wider market, clearly consistent quality and standards that we have must be appropriate for a wider competitive market. I also believe that export opportunities have always existed, but in many ways they have now increased. Market access will be important in going beyond Nigeria's shores. In the same way that it will be difficult for a foreigner to set up in Nigeria without having a Nigerian partner. If you want your goods and services to travel across the continent, you also need to consider partnerships and collaboration with partners outside Nigeria. There are a number of incentives in government. The incentives um, exist generally for business in Nigeria. We're in the process of um, designing incentives that will be appropriate to support the AFCFTA. But this document was, was prepared in 2017 and is in the process of being updated now. It, it captures all the investment incentives that exist in Nigeria now. I extracted six of them um, that we find uh, either people are not aware of or are the more popular ones. Um, but one of the most popular incentives is this pioneer status incentive that gives companies in industries recognized as pioneer a three to five year company income tax holiday. So it may not be appropriate for um, micro, um, for very small, because the new um, Finance Act of 2019 and 2020 give them some succor from tax um, payment anyway. But as your business grows, if it qualifies for the pioneer status incentive, I will suggest that you consider applying for it. The export expansion grants that are aimed at encouraging particularly non-oil exports, manufacturing in Nigeria and exports outside Nigeria. And government is also interested in driving um, investment and development through um, the special economic zones. The agency I work for, Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission, I find many people are not as familiar with. It was established to encourage, promote and coordinate investments in Nigeria. And we serve four principal functions promoting Nigeria as an attractive investment destination um, and encouraging investments, whether they're by Nigerians or by non-Nigerians, helping um, to support investors um, to first register their businesses in Nigeria, but also to match make um, investors, particularly um, in interface with government agencies. Then policy advocacy, the last aspect of our mandate involves initiating or supporting measures that enhance Nigeria's investment climate. The AFCFTA is in many ways a complex agreement. It has turned Nigeria from the largest single market in Africa to one country in the AFCFTA, the largest single market in Africa. It gives all Nigerian um, businesses the opportunity to venture beyond Nigeria and its 36 states into the countries on the African continent. But education, understanding are very key to fully understanding what the agreement says okay. and how you take full advantage okay. of it. Again, I thank you for giving me the opportunity okay. to speak today. At any case, I'm sure that I'm within my 25 minutes allotted time. You are very much just exactly on the dot of your allotted time. I thank you very much because you, you actually presented quite a lot of information, but you also presented it in such a way where we can appreciate it in different forms. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you for highlighting um, quite a lot of things uh, from the AFCFTA agreement. I like the first point you made from the beginning that you know we also should also make an attempt to try to reach through and really understand the details 
of some of this. So it's, it's quite complex uh, in some ways, but I think that's also a general advice that needs to go, not just on the agreement, but even things around the Kama Act and the Finance Act. And one of the things we will probably do and organize with the EXCO is also now do workshops that allow us to take this from just this high level discussion, discussion, discussion session um, to much more practical workshops uh, with, with people. Uh, so thank you very much. But really also uh, providing the, uh, the progression um, uh, of, the, of, of how we even got here to date, um, the targets in terms of the progressive elimination of tariff and non-tariff barriers. Um, and um, I think what it really it, it presents is the opportunity for us not to think of just our markets as Nigeria, but to think of our markets in the larger region of it. You also spoke a lot around um, the work being done to also help to drive and continue to enable investor interest in Nigeria and what the NIPC is doing um, in this regard, including some of the incentives available. Uh, but one of the things you also talked about was while a lot of these agreements are still being detailed and the practical modalities are still being fleshed out, how do we also, whether from a product or services point of view as entrepreneurs, also prepare ourselves to do that? So things around standards and quality assurance, because now um, you have to make sure that you also understand some of the larger uh, quality assurance requirements and regulations for whatever product and or services uh, that our companies um, deliver and how that also can meet the, leads, the needs of the wider market that we're, um, that we're reaching out to. So thank you very much. I know we have some additional questions that have also come in for you and we will take them in the Q&A session. And just a reminder to everyone, please, uh, we would only be taking questions in the Q&A session. I think um, a few of us have put some questions in the chat box. So please let's put them in the Q&A session um, section rather and we'll address them accordingly so uh, moving on to our last uh, speaker for today um, please join me uh, in welcoming our third speaker who is Dr. Ola Brown and who will be taking on the session that we'll be having around resilience building strategies for Nigerian entrepreneurs in 2021. This actually is something that we decided to add into the conversation this year, because typically a lot of our conversations, when we've had them in previous outlook sessions, speak broadly around the macroeconomic outlook and other regulatory implications. But we also thought to also now bring it home to say, okay, what are some, we've heard a lot about the talk around building resilience, enabling us as entrepreneurs and ourselves and our business structure to also be able to survive um, sometimes even this uncertainties or even to take advantage of that. And we've invited um, Ola to, to lead this session. Uh, Dr. Brown is the founder of the Flying Doctors Healthcare Investment Group, uh, which invests and operates across the healthcare and wellness value chain. She's, uh, she's, she's her background is in medicine, and after which uh, she proceeded to now study different things, including most recently having a master's degree in finance and economics at the University of London. Along with two other directors, Dr. Ola runs uh, the leading health, uh, early stage venture capital firm, which is Green Tree, Green Tree Investment Company, which provides growth capital to some of Africa's most exciting tech startups. And they've invested in quite a lot of startups across different sectors, um, including FinTech, AgriTech, Manufacturing, Health Tech, and EduTech. And the total value of their portfolio to date is almost $80 million. Uh, she sits on the board of the Professional Women's Network, uh, the Lagos State, State Chapter, and she also leads the Health Sector Business Group at the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. She facilitates trade between Nigeria, the United States, and the United Kingdom, and has seats on the committee of the British Business Group in Lagos and the Nigerian American Chamber of Commerce, the healthcare section. Please, um, Faith Foundation alumni committee members, join me in welcoming Dr. Ola Brown to take the final uh, segment of our session. You're welcome. Okay, please, can we unmute yes. Dr. All right, Thank perfect. <laughs> Hi, um, and lovely to see everybody here. There's what, 271 people. Um, so it's really exciting um, to be in amongst this group of fantastic entrepreneurs. And 
Um, I hope that, you know, my presentation will be useful to you. Um, Nick has given me a really great uh, introduction, but what she didn't say was, you know, I started my business quite young. I was 22 when I started my business um, and I had to build a lot of resilience. Uh, I had to be able to, um, you know, face a lot of challenges. So what I'll be sharing is um, around sort of how I um, faced some of the challenges, the lessons I've learned um, around um, resilience. Um, so the first five points, um, and I'll just read a quote um, that a friend taught me. Um, she said that all skills, even the ones that you think are natural, um, are learnable um, with focus. And I think it's something that I've always sort of secretly, you know, but never really liked. I tend to think that people, you know, know things naturally um, and they have a natural ability to do things. And a lot of people are born, you know, basketballers, swimmers, um, are born with physiological differences that make them superior. Some people are taller, uh, some people have their lungs, um, uh, um, to hold their breath for longer. Um, but a lot of the skills in business, um, once we have the ability to assess our strengths and weaknesses, are actually level, um, with focus. Um, and not just with focus, but also um, with good people around you. Uh, and good people decide is, um, you know, in my opinion, one of the best business issues um, in Nigeria. Um, and I think that one of the things that has helped my resilience, which is not in the presentation, um, but definitely has helped me is having people around me. Um, and I don't necessarily mean having family members and friends that you like, um, but having people that can tell you the truth, even when you don't want to hear it. My most valuable friends um, and most valuable mentors are, you know, the kind of people that can give me honest data-driven feedback um, about what I'm doing, um, sometimes even being able to see something wrong before I'm about to do it. Um, but, and that's quite rare, I think, in Nigeria. Um, you know, in Nigeria, we tend to have the attitude of, you know, by God's grace, it will happen. The worry, yeah, fantastic. You know, if you want to find a lot of praise singers, and that's quite easy, but if you want to find, you know, a group of mentors that support you, and it can even be a peer mentorship group that you set up for yourself. Um, you know, having those people around you is really, really important during the times when you need resilience, um, when you need that support, but you also need um, direct feedback. Um, so one of the most sort of useful things I have got my resilience um, are group of mentors and um, my coaches um, and even my executive team members um, that have really been able to give feedback and helped me to sort of make decisions and put it in those decisions. Um, and a lot of people think that a mentor is supposed to be somebody that, you know, is more successful than you, miles more successful to you than you. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily true. I've gone to a small group called the Mastermind Group of just eight people, and we meet on a monthly basis. We have a structure. We pay a fee to be part of that group. Um, and we talk about problems with each other. I think because we're on the same financial level in that group, we can do favors for each other. Whereas maybe if I was in the same mentorship group as Aliko Dangote, I'll always be the one asking. <laughs> and maybe I will, I will find it very difficult um, to add much value to that relationship and it becomes one-sided. Um, but in a peer mentorship group, um, you know, you're all kind of at the same earning level, the kind of sizes of businesses. Um, so there's reciprocity there. And, and that group we've been together for five years, almost. We go away once a year together, we go on a retreat. And when I'm feeling a bit low on resilience, um, they're my first call of call. Uh, they're the first people that I go to. And when they're feeling a bit low, um, on their levels of resilience, um, then they are, I hope, I'm one of the first, I think, <laughs> I'm one of the first people that they also um, turn to. So I think, you know, the number one point about resilience, I'll make it now, I'll make it out of the presentation, is the quality of your support system. Um, and there's very good evidence in science um, for the value of support systems. 
a little about seven areas in the world called blue zones. Um, so that's the first thing to Google about blue zones. And they're just zones of the world where people live longer than most people around the world. Um, and one thing they have is very good diets. So people that live in blue zones have good diets. Um, people that um, live in blue zones also exercise, but also they have good support systems. They have close friends and family relationships. Um, so not only do these support systems and these relationships and these mentors and these coaches build your relationships, but they can actually help you to live longer as well. Um, the final point that I'll make is, you know, for coaching um, a good professional coach, um, not your peer mentorship, but for a good professional coach, these positions are usually paid. Um, and, and you might have to, you know, sacrifice some of the money that you use to do other things um, to pay for a good business coach. But um, my coaching sessions have sort of a 10x return on investment. So for me, um, they've been one of the best investments that I've made um, because that formalizes the relationship. Um, it focuses the relationship um, and it makes sure that there's a solid agreement there. And I think that this is particularly um, important for women in business. Um, you know, I think that in Nigeria, there's some exploitative situations that could happen. Um, but when you have some kind of MOU, some kind of agreement, some kind of, no matter how rich the person is, but there's something formal between you, especially if it's a guy, then it kind of helps to, to, to draw that line um, when you're looking for mentors or coaches. Um, so that's my very, very first point that I'll make about resilience. Um, resilience um, can be learnt, number one. Um, it's something that you can get better at, number two. And I think the most important thing for resilience, although I'm going to be talking about a lot of technical stuff throughout the presentation, I think the most important um, thing for resilience is your state of mind um, and the kind of support system, the quality of the support system that you have around you. So now the more technical stuff around resilience um, building for Nigerian entrepreneurs. Um, I have four points here. Um, first of all, I'll be talking about the market size in Nigeria and, I, and um, my big sister, Yawande Sadiq, who has already spoken um, a bit about that when she touched on, um, on Af um, the African Free Trade um, Agreement um, and, you know, how we can sometimes make the mistake of um, undersizing the potential market for our products. Um, and then I'll go on to talk about taking a global perspective um, and how we can think about um, our business in a global world. Um, and then I'll be speaking about growing um, because I think that businesses themselves are more resilient um, when they are large, when they have growth, when they have significant revenues, when you have retained earnings that you can on in hard times. Um, and number four, I'll talk about mental health and support systems once again, because I believe that that's super important. Um, if you're, for your business to be resilient, your mind has to be resilient. You have to be um, a resilient person. You have to develop that skill. Um, and I think it's easier to develop with good people around you. Sorry to call that. my session. Yes, so just a quick one. So the, the audio quality is a bit patchy. So I wanted to suggest if you can turn off your video, so maybe that will help. Um, the audio okay. will be better. Thank you. Okay, is it better now? Uh, it seems like it. Can so we'll, we'll let you know. We can hear you. Please go on. Thank you. So, okay. Um, so I'll just start with that slide again in case um, you didn't pick up on that. I said I'm going to talk about four things. I'm going to talk about focusing on market size. I'm going to talk about taking a global perspective. I'm going to talk about growth for resilience because obviously if you have a big company, then it's almost automatically more resilient because you have uh, retained earnings that can help you through the hard times. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, mental health because you yourself have to be resilient uh, to lead a resilient business. So this is my obsession. Um, I think about market size, I invest, um, and when I invest, I consider the market size. Um, I think the most important 
sort of decision that you make in business, um, according to McKinsey, is your choice of industry. Um, I always say that, you know, you need to, before you start any business, you need to look at industry. And there's um, a very good graph. I didn't include it in this uh, presentation, but I'll send it to Adenika about industries and just how different the returns on an industry level have been um, in America, but also in Nigeria. So if you look at financial services in Nigeria, for example, that's an industry that has seen terrific growth. Um, if you look at oil and gas in Nigeria, you know, that's another industry that has seen huge growth um, over the past sort of 10 years. And there's a lot of money to be made in that industry. Um, so according to McKinsey and a few other studies um, that I'll share with you that are a bit boring, but if you want to do further reading, um, you can. Um, one of the most important decisions that you make is about industry. Um, and this is really interesting coming from a doctor, um, that if I was practicing as a medical doctor, you know, how much income could I possibly make um, working as a doctor? Owning a hospital, you know, how much income could I possibly generate from owning a hospital? compared to an upstream oil and gas company where very different figures are involved, compared to a bank where very different figures are involved. Think of this industry and then also understanding your market size are really, really important. Um, one of the things I always kind of joke about when I'm talking about hospitals and um, medical businesses is, you know, I always say that the market size, the total market of all the hospitals in Nigeria and the revenue they make, the, what ExxonMobil makes in Nigeria, what Chevron makes in Nigeria. So um, I think it's always a good idea to look at the data for both your industry and your market, and then figure out who your customer is and what their spending power is, how many customers there are, um, before when you're making your um, business strategy. So when you talk about the Nigerian um, population, there's about nine, 2,000 people um, that are defined as um, upper middle class. Um, if you want to see the paper where these figures came from, um, the paper was presented by, ah, oh, Mr. Taiwo, the paper was presented actually by another senior um, and established partner like Mr. Taiwo in PwC. His name is Andrew Nevin, he's an economist. And it was a presentation, I think, to the Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria where he did the down um, of Nigeria population by holding. Um, and some statistics are taken from McKinsey, some of them are uh, PwC, so they're merged together. Um, but two million people in Nigeria are upper middle class, and those people earn more than $9,000 per year. So if your product is targeted for people that earn $9,000 a year, then you have a market of 2 million people. Those are the people that you can sell to in Nigeria. Um, and, you know, if you're thinking that you can get 1% of that market, then you know what, you know, your kind of revenues would be from that. Um, just for contrast, because a lot of people also ask me, you know, why does healthcare work so well in India um, and it doesn't work in Nigeria? Well, in India, the number of people that earn above $9,000 a year are 100 million people. So when it comes to doing high-end products or higher-end products aimed at the upper middle class, they actually have a market of 100 million people that spend the same currency, that are within the same geographical zone um, that can afford their products. But in Nigeria, it's just 2,000. Now, when you come into the skilled aspirational class, which is between $4,500 and $9,000 yearly, there's 8 million people. So even when you're targeting the skilled aspirational, you still have to use the figure of 8 million to see if you're looking to expand in, um, um, in Nigeria to, to um, understand 
how many people can pay for your product, how many people would pay for your product, how many potential customers you might have, and you know how much you can make. Um, in the survivors category, which is $1,000 um, to $4,000, um, dollars yearly um, in narrow terms that would be people that earn about 30k per month there's a load of people so if your product is targeted at that 30k per month 50k 40k per month category of people then you have a whole load of people 65 million but then we have people actually below poverty line here uh, so we also have those to think about the ultra the ultra poor so when you're building or trying to build a resilient business, I think it's important um, to understand why the number one reason why startup businesses fail is because there's no market need for the product. Um, and also you won't be resilient if you're only, you're only appealing to a very small segment of the population um, that are not enough to carry the cost of the business or not enough to um, expand within the business. Um, so that's sort of my first point on, on, on market size and really thinking about your industry and thinking about your market size um, and including those kind of figures. I have a lot more figures, but I don't want to bore you. I have, I'm a woman of many graphs. I can send them all to Dike if you want to see. Even my local government in Lagos, I have the breakdown. By spending power per state, I have the breakdown. So it just helps you think. And by industry, most importantly, I have the breakdown. If you're a lazy person and you get an oil block, chances are you're probably going to make money because that industry is huge. Um, so industry is also something to think about. And I'll be explaining later on in the slides um, around building a, a resilient business by growing into industries. Um, so I've spoken about this, the startup stacks, um, the, in India, where you have uh, 110 actually million people earning more than $9,000 um, compared to just 2,000 in Nigeria. Um, whether Nigeria, um, India actually has fewer poor people um, than, than, um, than Nigeria. Um, the second point is around taking a global perspective um, and realizing that you know, if your immediate market doesn't have effective demand, then look at a global market. Um, so Nando's is actually one of my favorite companies um, because the, they started off in South Africa and really conquered the South African market with their restaurants. Um, and then there are a lot of countries that surrounded South Africa. They could have gone to Botswana. They could have gone to Namibia, they could have gone to Zambia, um, but they just went straight to London and became one of the biggest supermarket chain, um, the biggest restaurant chains in London. Um, and you can see global perspective in their strategy um, because they didn't just see, you know, the next place to go was the, places clo the place closer, closest to them. They went to the place that had spending power. They went to the place that had money. I mean, how well would they have possibly done in Botswana or Lesotho compared to London? So I think this is one of my most interesting businesses. Um, and there's another business that I really like. Um, it's a hospital group, South African hospital group again, the same strategy. This hospital group makes more money than Aliko Dangote in terms of the group, not in terms of the person that owns it. And again, they started off in South Africa. They built a few hospitals in South Africa. The whole of Africa was there for them to continue building hospitals. But I felt that they, their priority was being a resilient business. So they built outside South Africa. Again, they went straight to Switzerland and built their next few hospitals. Then they went to Dubai. Then they went to London and listed on the London Stock Exchange um, at a I think $6 billion, $6 billion valuation. Even if you built hospitals across Africa, not that valuation, or you'd have suffered to get that valuation. So the African traders um, agreement is fantastic. And if you do have products that you want to scale across Africa, please do. But also think in a global perspective. We live in a global world. 
I give the examples that foreign oil and gas companies, they come here. Sinopec, the Chinese national company, is here doing business. Um, Chevron, Shell, they all come here to do business because they see a business that they like. Our national oil company doesn't do business globally. And I think a lot of our businesses aren't, a, aren't trying or aren't doing business globally. Um, I think it's really important to look at where the money is for the business that you want to do and, and try and look at the market size um, and see, you know, where do I scale to? Do I scale to the place where there is the most, uh, that is closest to me? Or do I scale to the place where there's effective customer demand? Um, Israel is one of my favorite countries in terms of business. Um, if you look at the amount of venture capital investments per person, we have the highest venture capital investments in the world. Um, and it's actually don't for Israelis. Built for they build for American companies for American market. They build software for the UK market and focus on their market because their own market is very small. So I always have this book that I was talking about. This idea that you know the local market is nice, but certain kinds of products just don't sell here. Israel's total population is less than 10 million. Hello? Yes, Hello? we can hear you. Hello? Okay. Yes, but we can Hi, can't I didn't even... Can't yeah, we can't see I your slide. Even... Okay. I didn't even notice where it stopped. Um, no. Did you hear the Israel bit? Yes, we had your, we had, we literally had up to the last five seconds. Uh, yeah. I want to mention that we have. Okay, so I was just saying. Round up your okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I was just saying that, you know, um, they think globally and they've been very, very successful. I mean, Israel is called the Startup Nation and it's a very good book, which you can download on your phones um, from audible.com. It's called the Startup Nation and it's one of my favorite books because it tells the story of how Israel was able to break into global markets. Um, and put a growth strategy together. When your business is big, like I said, it's more resilient. Uh, three ways that you can sort of grow your business. You can expand um, by enlarging your asset portfolio, um, building new demand, acquiring aligned business businesses. You can enhance the business by finding new business models, or you can extend the business by broadening um, the footprint of the business. And you can see in the Nigerian banking industry even, um, a lot of banks are going into a hold co structure and extending their business, increasing their product offerings. Um, the best things of the, of the Tolerant group, um, just by distributing noodles, they became very good at distribution. Um, and they had like all these trucks, right? Um, and they realized that they were very good at getting stuff across Nigeria. Um, so not only are they the biggest noodle company in Nigeria, um, but also they are one of the biggest logistics companies too, because they started selling this distribution expertise um, to other companies. Um, so maximize opportunities for growth. And that's also how to build a resilient company. And then uh, look after your mental health. Like I said, friends, the family you choose, mentors, coaches, Peer group members, very important. People overlook them, but peer groups and mastermind groups are really important as well. Um, good diet, good exercise are also to help you yourself as a person become resilient and so you can pass it resilient. Pass it resilient. Okay. Yes. 
Yes, the network is bad. We can't hear Dr. Ola again, um, but I know she was rounding up her session. So thank you very much if you can hear us. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, she spoke about two things around resilience. So resilience for your business and resilience for yourself as the entrepreneur. Um, if anyone has not read um, her write-up, The Mystery of the Market Size, I definitely will. If you Google it, you will find it where she spoke in a lot of detail around some of the things she's spoken about here around dimensioning your market, knowing where the money is and knowing what makes sense for your business and how, how to go about it. But also the importance of you taking care of yourself mentally, physically, surrounded, surrounding yourself with people you can bounce ideas of having mentors that can enable and support you with that. Thank you once again very much, Dr. Ola. I hope you are still with us. As we move to the Q&A session, uh, we have quite a number of questions already on Q&A, and there were some that were already sent in ahead of the session. And to do justice to effective moderation um, is my co-host for today, um, none other than the president of our alumni, executive committee who is uh, Max Menkiti. Uh, Max Menkiti has over 18 years entrepreneurial experience himself in the hospitality space, setting up businesses, buying businesses, exiting businesses, and really expanding across the space. Um, he established the Avenue Hotels and has uh, co-founded the Bottles American Restaurant, which I know some of us were familiar with, which also won quite a few awards uh, in his time. Um, he's, he shares a lot of his experience across all our programs, our AP programs, our EEP programs, has been an entrepreneur in residence several times, course director several times. And it's no wonder that in 2019, he was elected to be the president of our FATE Alumni Executive Committee. So I will like to hand over to Max Menkiti to moderate the Q&A session. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Indy. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, I'm quite excited to, to be here today. And I know that quite a lot of people have joined us um, from different parts of Nigeria and indeed different parts of the world. I hope you've been taking notes because it's, I promised it to be a supercharged event and so far, I think all the three speakers have delivered immense value. So we, for brevity of time, we're going to jump straight in and uh, I'll be happy to look at your questions. If you have any questions, please put them down on the Q&A section, not on the chat box, and I'll try and go through them. So um, thank you. Welcome to all our panelists again. I would uh, open the Q&A chat and I'll begin to take the questions. I know there are quite a lot of questions and they, they are in order of the presentations that were made by the speakers. So the first series of questions would be for Mr. Taiwo. So um, I would like to kick off. While I am getting the, the, the questions out and trying to read them, I'd like to ask a question to Mr. Taiwo, please. Um, and it's about this GSM NIN registration thing that's ongoing, you know, just to capture that, Mr. Mr. Kyle. Could you speak to that? How do you think that one, cutting off the GSM SIMs of people who are small businesses, maybe depend on this for their banking um, applications in different parts of remote Nigeria? How would you think it will affect them also customer size, because most of, of the, um, with COVID, everyone has gone digital and the prime tool for communicating is a telephone, right? In Nigeria, in our own environment. So could you just speak to what you feel would be the effect, if they're gonna be positive or negative? And while you do that as a warm up question, I would go into the Q and A and then pull out some much harder questions for you from our community. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I think from a policy perspective, um, what government is trying to do is something that many Nigerians uh, have been asking government to do for so long. Uh, we just didn't understand why we were disjointed. We did not link things together. You recreate biometrics every time. It didn't make sense. So finally, we decided that we need to have um, one, one point of truth. 
and then that has to be your national identity number. And a law was enacted many years ago, so this is not even new. Uh, but then government was slow in implementing it, awareness was poor, and then suddenly government says, if you haven't done it, you will not be able to use a mobile phone, and then everybody is rushing out to go and do it. So if, if we are looking for blames to share, there'll be more than enough to go around. Uh, so, but maybe we need to then move forward and say, what should we be doing? So we know it's the right policy. We can disagree with government's approach. I personally think that it's a much better way to do it than what we're doing, especially given COVID-19 and the exposure. But for us on this call, since we can't change that, right? What we can do is, what can we do to take care of ourselves and also contribute to the debate uh, in case somebody is listening in government. I'll say one, uh, because of COVID and more people moving online, just to survive, uh, you know, a lot of businesses now rely on telecommunication, mobile banking and all of that. So you have to make sure that you do the registration. First establish whether you're registered and then find uh, a decent way to do it. It will be painful for those who haven't done it before now uh, but it's something that you need to do. Uh, I'm hoping that government also would, um, you know, look at what is uh, best for Nigeria. I don't think the best thing for us is to do the cut off in February, it's just too close. Uh, we need to find a decent way to do it so that we don't expose people to COVID-19. We also don't give up on the NIN project because it's good. Uh, and then just find uh, a way to also harmonize. If somebody has BVN, for example, I do think, that that data in itself is, uh, I can't remember anything I gave for NIN that was, you know, more than what I gave for BVN. So, uh, and I heard over 40 million people have been already provided. Same thing with even phone registration. So hopefully we get a point where we figure it out <laughs> as we go along. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so the takeaways there would be, it's come to stay. It's something that the government should have done some time back. And, um, you know, this last minute uh, dot com attitude that we, we seem to have as entrepreneurs and as a government and as a people generally, it doesn't help. But so to small businesses, it's something you need to do. And if you have critical customers that you communicate with across the telephone, you rely on to place orders to pay you, you know, by telephone banking, then it's absolutely vital that we encourage them to do this NIN registration. And perhaps you could send emails or text messages out to them, uh, encouraging, encouraging them and listing out the steps or um, what would I call it, the links to, to encourage our customers to, to register. Okay, so looking at the questions, uh, a lot of people saying thank you. Great presentation, Mr. Taiwo. Uh, a lot of people are asking for your slides. Uh, so I'm not gonna respond to those questions, <laughs> but the slides, were, the slides were great. Okay, so how can the slides be made or sent to participants? Uh, let's go scroll down. Okay, please, can you throw more light on the HBRL adoption and how it affects bank accounts? That's that's a question from Eforma Okoro. Mm -hmm. um, do you, Mr. Mr. Taiwo, could you just quickly, for brevity, just sharpen yes. it straight, please? Thank you. Yes. So, uh, extensible business reporting language is really to simplify. Um, a technological way of trying to make sure that information is streamlined, is easy to analyze, um, it's not easy to manipulate. For example, if anybody says, how much dividend did Nigerian companies pay to foreign investors in 2020? Nobody has that data. Whereas when you pay a dividend, it has a line in your financial statement. If everybody submitting their accounts had a standard code for dividend to foreigners. You just need one click and you pick that figure up. Same thing goes for whether you're looking at turnover, whether you're looking at staff costs. We, we spoke about electricity costs, for example, who knows the exact amount? Nobody knows. We just extrapolate. So SBRL is, is, is what CAC, the Corporate Affairs Commission has now decided to use. I think the platform is live, but it's gonna take a while before everybody gets on it. When you then submit your account, you follow those standard procedures and put your information there. Once we all get on board, or at least most people, what you're gonna find is it will become the most reliable source because if you put your cash balance there, it's gonna try and reconcile it with what you put in your bank account. So if the things are not speaking together, somebody will raise a flag. The system itself can raise a flag when there are exceptions. 
Once that becomes a single point of truth, what it means is nobody else will be asking you to bring financial statement. They just get your assets to CAC portal and they can get your financial statement. So that way, people can't lie about presenting different accounts. So it's called SBRL, Extensible Business Reporting Language. Okay, thank you very much. Um, very technical, but I think you've managed <laughs> to answer that in a, in a way that most people would have. Um, I'd like to maybe say hello to Mrs. Yewande. How are you? Uh, could you? Well, okay, could you, Mr. Yeah, could President. You follow, <laughs> thank you very much for your, for your presentation. And I see the good work that you're doing. I've been uh, Googling you all over and reading about all the things that you have uh, been pushing for investments in Nigeria. So good job, good job. Very different from IBTC days. Welcome. So I'm going to throw a question to you um, uh, just to, to, to get you into the game, please. Uh, the first one here is from Ifani Duaka um, said, Madam Yewande, please, is there any specific roadmap from the Nigerian government to put Nigeria businessmen and entrepreneurs at an advantage. Um, so I think what that question is relating to is, is there sort of a fast track or maybe tax incentive or whatever? Is there any package, you know, the, a specific roadmap that people can key onto that would put Nigerian businessmen stroke entrepreneurs at an advantage um, as per regards to, to the, um, the, the act that we just signed? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. That's actually a very difficult question. Um, it's especially difficult if you're not a politician and you can only answer straight. Um, the reality is that there isn't a specific roadmap that provides that guidance. There are a number of work streams that are aimed at helping the private sector better understand um, the agreement. There are a number of initiatives aimed at um, creating incentives to encourage the export attitude that will protect Nigeria best in the context of that agreement. But as we talked about, I mean, Tao mentioned it, I mentioned it when I spoke, Oline very mentioned it when she spoke as well. There's some challenges that have dealt for us to leave block. Is that is the first Nigerian the agreement was negotiated by people in government who don't have the same commercial sense as you and I, who don't have the same, you know, so, so there might be elements in that agreement that have a commercial implication that they miss simply because that's not the business they do day to day. So we're working now with the National Action, um, National Committee that is working on implementing this. We're working with them at NIPC to produce more slides like the one I used to help simplify the language so people understand what the agreement says. Um, but I mentioned those um, organized private sector groups deliberately because that's generally how government is talking to the private sector. I suggest many, many, many workshops aimed at helping people in different industry groups better understand how the agreement relates to them. So giving somebody 15 minutes to speak is not going to do it. Giving somebody 30 minutes to speak is not going to do it. You know, spend half a day, look at the different elements of it, engage multiple stakeholders. We, ha we, are, we are lucky to the extent that nobody is fully ready. So everybody, in many ways, there, there are elements of the agreement that are still being negotiated we speak. So there's some things that are not fully bedded, but educating yourself about what it is, I think is useful. The high level overview is what I provided. We can now look beyond selling to 36 states to selling to all the countries in Africa. So inherently for the business that anybody does, thinking in that context, Ola spoke about Nando's going from South Africa straight to London. This agreement is aimed at making it easier for any Nigerian to go from Nigeria to Africa in the first instance. It doesn't stop you from going to London, but to Africa in the first instance. You cannot then ask me, working in government, how you should go to London, because you understand it better than I do. Do you see what I mean? Um, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I, I think that answers the question. 
Um, it's a little bit tricky. There's no exact um, roadmap that offers advantages. Um, are you still with us, Mrs. Yeah, one day? Are you still yes, with us? I am. I turned off okay, my very video good. for the next question. I, I understand. Okay, well, don't turn off yet because I've got my one of my own warm-up questions for you. So, okay. um, and I hope it's just going to make sense to, to, to quite a lot of people that are, that are here. Now, I love the phrase that you, you, you used. There was a phrase you threw out, but I'm not sure you, you really knew you were throwing out a powerful phrase. And that was something along the lines that Nigerians are essentially adaptable and an energetic people. I love that. And that, that is fantastic. That is something for, for us to, to hold on to. Now, in your presentation, I noticed something which I'm sure many people listening have also noticed. And here's my question. Why does it seem easier to export services from Nigeria to Africa than products, right? Um, because if you, if you remember the slide that you showed, you showed some examples. I mean, we can reel them off. GTB, you know, banking services. If you look at uh, Globe, you know, telecoms, it's more of a service. If you look at films, if you look at Nigerian music, um, the Finco and all the other um, um, things that have made headway in Africa, right? But in Nigeria, there's a push for us to move towards agriculture, for us to move towards manufacturing, which are really the drivers of any economy, right? If you, if, because they are the things that employ a larger base of people across different levels of, of, of um, education and expertise all over the nation. It's not just limited to a little pocket area. So isn't there a disconnect? And this is the point. Isn't there a disconnect between pushing people here to go into agriculture, manufacturing, et cetera, quote unquote, for export eventually. But in reality, what the market is accepting quicker in Africa as services. You know, could you, could you speak to that, please? Thank you. Um, okay, thank you for that. The, the market is accepting more than services in Africa. The market is accepting goods and services. They're just tracked differently. Um, you, uh, the slide that I put up that talked about the companies, I put up a speech bubble that says Nigeria's music, Nigeria's music, Nigeria's fashion, music, and movies travel across the continent. But I couldn't put a company to represent any of those because, many, because of the manner in which those things travel. So goods travel across the continent. They've been doing so. My granduncle um, was exporting yams from Nigeria when my father was a teenager and was in that business until he died. There are many people who export outside Nigeria, but because they're generally um, small and medium businesses, when you do a chart like the one I did, it doesn't capture that sort of business. It doesn't mean that it, it is not happening. It is just the manner in which it is captured. So what I showed are formalized large companies. If we had information on SMEs in Nigeria that are exporting, I'm sure you know, that we would have something similar. I met a woman in, um, in California, who uses who uses Nigeria buys ash okay from Nigeria and uses it to make tableware in California. The woman is not even Nigerian, but she has partners in Nigeria that make the clothes and export to her. So there's a lot of that happening. It's just not captured formally. But the African continental free trade area would mean that the duty that would have been paid if you exported from Nigeria to those countries would not apply for goods coming from Africa. So something coming from the US would have duty on it. Something coming from other African countries would not have duty on it. So you can have a price advantage because yours, your goods can come into the African country without the duty element. Um, but it, there, there are granular workshops, I think, that are required. It's not, for SMEs, a much more granular discussion, I think, is necessary than a high level one that, um, the time for this event allowed. Okay, thank you very much. While you were talking, I had about the Ashwa kid that was being taken to California. I had these images of uh, all these Biden uh, Ashwebi, which were <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> which were being made in Nigeria. Well, you know, Nigerians entrepreneurs, we exploit every opportunity uh, positively, rightly so. So I'm going to have to quicken our replies because there are a lot of questions. Uh, let's just go. So, Madam, again to you, and it says here, Lady Juliet Aigbe, she says a question for Yewande Sadiku. And she's put like four questions, but let's just take the top one. She goes, how does an SME like Cake Flair with an exportable product respond appropriately to the potential that 
the, the um, agreement um, presents. Madam, if you can just maybe two, three sentences, please, Wally. Fantastic <laughs> example. You are telling me not to speak too much. And okay, go, yeah, if you need to, cake go ahead. Makes cakes that, you know, people buy. If they can buy them in Nigeria, they can buy them in Ghana, they can buy them in Botswana, they can buy them in Kenya. How do you package your cakes to go from Nigeria to those markets? Would you transport the cakes in finished form or would you transport the butter that is made in Nigeria and then baked when it arrives there? There are all those elements that only Cake Flair can comment on, but this allows Cake Flair to take their products into those markets. And I talked about the importance of partnership. You cannot enter a market like that to sell your products without feet on the ground. So finding a partner in the country to decide whether you tr export the cakes, you know, baked and frosted, or you'll export the cakes in butter form. So your partner in that market then bakes, or you issue, or you grant franchise licenses. So somebody uses the cake flair, cake flair brand in the market, but based on recipes, your principles, your logo and the like, you know, that's how I'd answer the question. All right, so I'm going to try and uh, thank you very much. I'm going to try and give you one more question here. Um, and again, I appreciate the brevity of your, your answers. So it's from Dennis Onwebu, and it says, Madam Yewande, is there any deliberate interface between NIPC and Nigerian banks to refocus banks in the country in adjusting their loans and other financial services to give Nigerian businesses certain advantages against others or full takeoff of the act. Um, so if I could okay. summarize that, he wants to know if the NIPC is interfacing with Nigerian banks, um, bringing out maybe grants or special training programs or uh, you know, interests that are, that are um, generous in order to encourage um, SMEs um, to be able to take full advantage. Thank and you. the answer is a very emphatic no. Banks have much, much deeper resources than NIPC can ever have. And the commercial value that AFCFTA represents for banks will inform their behavior in relation to loans for those who want to benefit from AFCFTA. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to ask you to uh, sit back a little bit, Madam Yewande. I'd like to bring Mr. Taiwo back up, please, front and center. And I have two questions to fire off to Mr. Taiwo, please. Um, Mr. Taiwo, are you still with us? Yes, very excellent. well. Excellent, excellent. Oh, I like your background. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, congrats, by the way. Uh, you, were, you were the seventh, I think you made the fastest partner in the big four globally within seven years. Right. Yes, based on available records, yes. Um, <laughs> congratulations, congratulations. You. Okay, so there are two questions here. Uh, the first one is from Dukwe, and it says, is commercial rent vatable? And then the, <laughs> the second question is what I'm laughing at. <laughs> but here it is, you know, it's from Anonymous. So it says here, kindly share if, they, if there's any plan by the government to resolve electricity problems. So, um, so I think resolve what? electricity problems. Ah. <laughs> I know you've spoken about it. You did speak about it in the presentation. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, so, but I, I'm, I'm obliged to read out the question. So I don't know. No, no, it's actually, it's, yeah, it's a good question. I, I think the two questions speak to actually the second, uh, the first and the second biggest cost for SMEs, uh, which is electricity cost and then rent. So let me start with the first question on rent. Uh, so what the law has done now, that's the Finance Act 2020 amending several laws, including the VAT law, is to say that land and building is not liable to VAT. That is now clear, black and white, simple, no complications. So if you buy a building now, if you are transferring land, no VAT. The one that is not straightforward and clearly stated is that when you rent a building, it could be for business, it could be for residential, you are paying for the rights to use a building, right? A building is not a vatable asset. So therefore the right to use the building is not liable to VAT. So I will not pay VAT because I know when they come to me, I can argue my case. 
So if you don't fully really understand what it is, you need to find someone who can help you. But uh, I would say you are maybe about 70, 80% safe not to pay VAT on rent anymore based on that law. If anybody challenges you, please uh, raise the issue. And, and sometimes what you can also do is just follow authorities on this subject. And when they share those kind of information, keep it. So when they come to you, say, well, somebody says there's no VAT, and then they, they will consider that as... Uh, so the second question around electricity is this is one of the biggest challenges we face as a country. It continues to uh, be with us, unfortunately. Government always has a plan. They have planned for fossil fuel. They have planned for the regular electricity. They have the one for clean energy. Uh, but these plans sometimes are not diligently implemented. Do I see anything changing significantly in the next one, two, three years? I'll be honest with you, the answer is no. So which means on your own, you have to think about energy efficiency means. So you, you, we don't all have to be experts in finance, but you need to sit back, look at the amount you're spending on energy and electricity, and see what can you do differently? Sometimes it's a switch between diesel and petrol. Sometimes it's between diesel, petrol, and using solar power. It may be that the initial outlay is high, but over time it saves you cost. Do whatever you can. And if you are still on a meter where they're giving you estimated billing, that is not helping you. How can you get prepaid meters so your cost is not only decent, but it's predictable? Uh, that's the way I will put it. Thank you very much. Uh, there's still another question for you, but I'll just try and uh, speak with Dr. Ola. Um, so if you'd like to just sit back, but don't relax too much. Dr. Sure. Ola, hello, how are you? Are you with us? Uh, hello, are you having bandwidth challenges? Uh, okay. Dr. Ola, can you, are you with us? Can I? So we'll check up on her and we'll let you know. Yeah, okay. okay, I think we'll let you know once she's back on. Thank you. Okay. Um, right, I'll just try and bring up the screen back for the Q&A. Okay, thank you very I'll much. I'll ask more questions in the meantime. Okay, um, hi, sorry, I couldn't okay. unmute. Um, so I just typed it in the... Um, in the, chat in the comment section and I think somebody, yeah, somebody unmuted me. Hi, Dr. Ola, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for taking time out to come and speak to our wonderful entrepreneur community. You as uh, one of our top entrepreneurs as well in the country. So you, you said some things and I liked your presentation on resilience because uh, the way I see our seminar here, our, our business outlook, we've had content from the first speaker, core content from the second speaker, and you as the third panelist or third speaker, you've been able to wrap it around to give us actionable points, which would allow us um, integrate the first two contents um, perfectly into, into 2021. So you said uh, that a resilient person builds a resilient business. You also mentioned that retained earnings are key. Now, and I'm going to ask you a funny question, right? But, you know, I just want to see what, what, what you say. Now, if you could start afresh, completely afresh, what business or rather what sector would you go into? So if, if you were going to start a small or micro scale business, fresh this year, 2021, I'd like you to tell us what sector that would be. And I'd like you to give us about one or two reasons why. Thank you. Oh, I do a technology business aimed at um, Europe or America. Um, I think, you know, I'm a data driven person and sort of studying finance, studying economics and also working for venture, um, working in venture capital, um, running my own funds. Um, I understand the power of technology, especially when it's not targeted at a small market. Americans will buy anything. They have money. Their GDP is $60,000 per capita. Europeans will buy anything that you put on the table that is useful. Um, so I definitely start a technology company, but not aimed at the Nigerian market, aimed at a foreign market, but based in Nigeria. So I have dollar income and Naira expenses. Fantastic. So um, I think you've given some very key tips there. Now, I, I would like to, to ask you, you mentioned that 
there are color zones, right? The blue color zone that people live live within, um, etc. What color zone would you put Nigeria in on the map? Or are we color zone? What sort of color zone block are we in? And if it's not so much of a good zone, what are two, three tips that you could give easily um, just to us as entrepreneurs to put ourselves in a good mental space so that we can we can deliver the excellence that we need in our businesses? Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll start by sort of adding some context into that zone um, discussion and then um, talking about um, what we can do as entrepreneurs. Um, so firstly, um, in terms of when I was speaking about the zones, I spoke about the blue zones because these are zones in the world where people live longer and they live longer because of their diet, their exercise and um, their social connections um, and um, their general healthcare system. So um, Nigeria, Nigerians have a very low life expectancy when you look at the data overall. Um, and, you know, we I'm sure we can all figure out uh, most of the reasons why. Um, but leading back to entrepreneurship, um, I think the question is, you know, how can we develop as a country? How does how does Nigeria get to get from where we are um, to a better place? Um, and I think, you know, that's such an interesting question um, because there's a professor at Harvard. Oh my gosh, I'm giving you guys so much work. Um, there's a professor in Har um, Harvard. I've forgotten his name, but if you Google Harvard Monkeys and Ladders Development. Um, you'll get his name and he gives a wonderful lecture on what makes countries prosper, what makes countries more developed than others, um, and what makes countries poor, what makes countries rich. Um, I think his name is Professor Holschman, if I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong about that. Um, but um, he gives this long lecture about what makes countries prosperous. And I think your question was around how does Nigeria get better and how can entrepreneurs be a part of that? Um, I think that countries by and large um, get better from know-how. And that was what his research showed, um, that countries that have the most know-how in terms of innovation um, develop faster. Um, and countries that don't have some kind of intrinsic know-how um, develop slower. Um, and he gave example of Malawi, which was, is probably the poorest country in the world. Um, and he believes that that is because of low levels of know-how. Um, so I think that there are a lot of things um, that people on this call can do to increase um, their know-how to make it um, competitive, globally competitive. Um, and I think that the internet has kind of democratized learning in a way that we've never seen before. Um, so I have my master list on my Twitter handle. There's a, a master list of everything an executive or an entrepreneur needs to know from um, YouTube. And that thread contains about 1,000 to 2,000 videos um, that are educational, um, that increase our know-how, that increase our ability to innovate, um, because I think that's really important. And if you think back to the original entrepreneurs in America, the Carnegie's, the Rockefeller's, the, um, the JP Morgan's, um, America, I don't think, you know, had the best leadership. I mean, American leaders were they could, agreed to take black people from um, um, West Africa and turn them into slaves in America. I don't think they were the kindest leaders. I'm not sure that they were the most competent leaders, but they had inventors. And the environment was not enabling for those inventors. Rockefeller was actually from a poor family. And to get the formula for Standard Oil, which became the biggest company in the world at a time, um, he had to do repeated sort of experiments. He wasn't well educated, but he had to like invent a new way to cook. If you remember, the reason why Standard Oil was called Standard Oil was because it was him that invented that formula um, of oil that you could use in the home that your house would not blow up um, and it would not also not light. So I think it's important to keep this know-how in mind and make that front and center, right? How can we develop know-how on despite the flaws of our education system. And if you think back to then, um, the American system at that time had serious flaws in education. And a lot of these guys that I'm talking about, the men who built America actually weren't very well educated and didn't have very good opportunities. If you think about infrastructure at that time, actually it was Henry Ford, an entrepreneur that started building roads in America. And the reason why is because he knew that nobody would buy cars unless 
he built the road. So he started frustrating the people that were trying to build railways, which was bad. And the government allowed it because obviously he was influential to build roads so that people would drive his cars and so he could sell more cars. So it wasn't as if the leadership in America was perfect, but the entrepreneurs were super aggressive and right. they had know-how. So I think that's a key to development, really, really pushing ourselves to develop know-how and develop know-how that is competitive globally. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to, I'm still in the mode of, in the mode of drawing out practical tips uh, with the questions that I'm asking you. So my second question would be, you mentioned earlier that you have benefited immensely from a mastermind group, right? That you have about six or eight people in a mastermind group that's been going on about five to six, seven years. Okay, question is this, for um, our community, entrepreneurs, SMEs, um, how would you, what are the two, three, four steps that you could recommend to people that would like to, um, identify, find, and join or start a mastermind group? So just quick three, four steps that they could take to find uh, a group in the Nigerian context, please, in the context of our environment. Thank you. I don't know if there are Fate Foundation mastermind groups already in the program, but um, if they're not, then they're pretty easy to start. You just get a group of people um, try not to have people within the same industry in the same group. So not, we don't have competitors in our own groups. Um, and I, th I think an ideal size is um, about six. We are eight in our group. Um, and then I think there is always a fee structure. So there's a yearly subscription to that mastermind group. Then there's the time that you meet, um, whether on a monthly basis, whether on a quarter, uh, quarterly basis, and you have a crib sheet that you fill out. Um, our crib sheet has um, the great things that happened this month, the bad things that happened this month, um, and in work, in our personal lives, and then what we need help with. And we all fill in that sheet before the group meeting, and then we talk about it. Um, and the beauty of a peer group is that I feel like there can be, you know, the, the, um, the currency, of a seat at the table is value. And it's very, very, very difficult to maintain a relationship with somebody, unless you are just blessed by God, um, with somebody that is far rich, richer than you, far more successful than you, when the person is not your mommy or your daddy or your daddy's friend, right? It's, it's a lot more difficult to do that if you're not bringing something to the table. But with peers, I help my peer group on a daily basis to do my small things. Um, and I mean, there's an earning level there. So to join the mastermind group, your value has to be, you know, XX amount. Um, but it's all, we're all in the same boat. And that peer group has been extremely, extremely useful over the years because it's, some, it's a group of people that can meet me, that have the time and ha I have their full attention for four hours per month to talk about my business and my problems. Um, and we do that every month. Um, we've done that every month for a year, but once a year, we also take a few days out to plan and go somewhere and do our yearly goals. So I know all of their goals. I have it in my head. So whenever I'm going through my day-to-day -day activities, I remember this person in my peer group said that this is their yearly goal and I'll be able to help them as well. Um, so I think accountability is important right. and the ways to do it is to bring people together, agree on, read books together, take courses together online, um, and set out what you want to achieve from the group and then obviously put some processes in place to achieve it. Fantastic. Uh, that's been a very comprehensive answer. And uh, Fit Foundation offers mentorship. I think this would be a very interesting um, development, you know, trying to create a master, mastermind group. Um, it's something that I'm going to, to push and discuss with my fellow exec members and Fit Foundation team so that we could see if we could really develop that um, develop that capacity to push you know a few number of people like-minded people higher in, in 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 different groups thank you now I'm going to for time I think our time is almost up so dr Ola you stay with me I'm going to give you um, what I call my parting question and I'm going to also give it to, to mr Taiwo and to madame Yewande as well but I'll start with you uh, dr Ola so what would be your defining one word for 2021? 
So if you could give our community of entrepreneurs here one word that you would use to encapsulate what you feel 2021 should be all about, could you tell us what your one word would be? I'll give you an example. Last year, the core word for us was resilience, right? Um, because of all the changes, et cetera, and all the pivoting and all the issues that people had to deal with. So resilience was a naturally resonating word that kept coming up. Um, so please, for our three panelists to round up, I'm going to limit you to one word only. Right? So I'll start with you, Dr. Now, what one word would you say, look, 2021, guys, it's, it's just going to be all about this. So this guy, we can just meditate on that and just have it in the back of our mind. I think I've explained that enough. So over to you, Dr. Ola. Let's have your one word. And if you'd like a sentence to explain why or how, you're welcome to do so. Thank you. One word, please. I think um, the word that kind of ties up um, what um, Yoande and Mr. Taiwo um, were saying for me um, and my own sort of contribution, my own presentation is scale. Um, how to move from, you know, um, I say women, how, how I, I talk about how Nigerian women how, um, um, must move from the buka to the boardroom. Um, so for me, that word is scale. Okay. And do you think that's practicable in 2021, given the COVID and all that? Is that you still stand by scale? Is that correct? That's what you push to our community, correct? Ah, well, I, I believe that. In every single recession, there are lots of people that lose money, but there are also a lot of people that their businesses were built through recessions. And if you go on Google and just look at the kind of businesses that were built in the worst of economic times, right. you'll be surprised yeah. that a lot of your favorite brands were built during really bad times. So I'll still say this is the time when nobody is looking. This is the time when nobody is aggressive. This is the time when people are sad. And that's the time that I feel I need to get amped up and scale. Fantastic. Thank you. I'd buttress what you're saying. I, I often tell people that um, I'm a child of the recession, right? Most of my successful businesses were started right in the middle of the recession. And over time, I've come to analyze that to find out that, look, when you can start in a difficult time, your company is lean. You cut out all the fat and all the excess things that you may have wanted to splash out on. And you just focus on surviving and building a great business. And so when times become good when the economy naturally expands you're perfectly placed you know to reap the, the rewards of the growth so from dr ola we have scale uh thank you very much dr ola i'm going to flip ladies first so mr taiwo the perfect gentleman i see you waiting thank you so you're just going to wait for a little bit longer madame year one day how are you i'm well my one Fantastic. word is much simpler than ola's it is presence now presence you're going to have to give us two sentences minimum to, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we want to, I want to clarify that you're not speaking like a pastor because, you know, sometimes we have these things that prophetic things that no one can really understand what they mean. Right. But everybody claims. So this presence, I needed to break it down for us so that we can have it top of mind. Thank yeah. you. To survive in 2021, you have to be present. You have to be emotionally, physically, and mentally present. So your, your health, as Ola you know, spoke about, is important. Um, your presence as a business, in terms of surviving the difficulty that the year will bring, is important. I, there are many businesses that will take advantage of the pandemic and scale. But many countries have suffered recessions. Nigeria is dealing with its own. Many businesses will not survive. And there are, hundred, there are brands that are decades and over centuries old that have disappeared. It's important that survival, being, present, being able to survive the now and be present at the end of 2021, I think is important. That's what I mean by presence. So it's your, your physical, mental, emotional presence, and then the presence of the business. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm so glad that you are speaking prophetically. Uh, you've been able to break it down into actionable steps or actionable um, explanations that we can use. So, Mr. Taiwo, I started off with you, sir. You started off um, as, as a key person, giving us the first presentation. So I'm going to round up with you. Now, you've cheated a little bit because you've heard me 
tell you what I'm going to ask you. I normally like to spring it as a surprise so that it can come from your subconscious. It's not really to trip you up, but when you pull something from your subconscious, sometimes it tends to pretty much bring out what you inherently believe. So we don't have that opportunity now. I'll bring it to you now. Could you tell us what your one word would be? Only one word and maybe break it down for us afterwards in about two sentences. Thank you, Mr. Taiwo. Thank you very much. I think I'll just build on the parting shot by both Dr. Ola and my sister, you and the very amazing ladies uh, today. And I'll say for me, it's opportunity. So I see opportunity because uh, to be honest, whatever you look for, you will find in life. So if you think it's problems everywhere and could be COVID and that's what you focus on, that's what you would find. And while you're there, uh, in self-pity and mystery and all of that, some other people are cleaning out on the opportunities. So and that goes back to what I said at the beginning. Uh, so the more the problems there are, the more the opportunities to solve the problems. Uh, so one of my partner colleagues was having her birthday yesterday. She decided she was going to buy food and send to us in her, in her home. And for the very first time, I saw a delivery person that was outstanding. They spoke good English. They did not stand out of the gate and said, Nikkei, yeah, come out. So, um, the packaging was extraordinary. I will pay three times to get that delivery done. So, okay, so they, were, they, were they a member of Faith Foundation alumni? If they are not, <laughs> don't mention the name, please. Thank you. Yes, no, I'm not going to mention the name. <laughs> so my parting shot is opportunity. Please look out for it. And when you do find it, don't jump, like Dr. Ola said. Uh, make sure that the assessment of the market, do you have people who can buy it? Just because you love it doesn't mean everybody wants, wants it as well. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. <laughs> Mr. Taiwo, fantastic. Um, it is true. I mean, we all know that whatever you look at, there you are. Whatever you see in the world, there you are, meaning that you only see what you actually believe, right? Okay. So if you have a mindset that is pessimistic, guess what? The way the brain works is it's going to bring answers to you that confirm what your beliefs are. So okay. I'd, 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 I'd really thank you for that. Um, and I'd really encourage everyone on this call to have an optimistic mindset because the brain tends to confirm what you believe right? Not really what you think, but what you believe. So if you believe it's going to be a tough year, if you believe things are going to be difficult, then the brain would attract and begin to show you things around that are going to confirm. So Mr. Taiwo, thank you very much, opportunity. Um, and then we have for Madame Yewande, we have presence. And then of course, Dr. Ola, we have scale. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been wonderful. Um, I'm happy to have been able to, 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 host this section and be able to ask some questions. We had so many questions that have not been able to be answered because of time, um, but perhaps you can send them in as an email to Faith Foundation, and then we would see if we're going to be able to, to get them off to the right um, panel members who may answer them, and then we'll be able to send them on forwards. Um, I wanna thank everyone here, and I think I'm preparing to hand back over to our ED. I'd like to tell everybody here, please, I want everybody to please, please, please remember, you know, there's always something you can do positively to improve yourself and improve your business. And even when the business doesn't seem to give you ideas, um, you can always involve yourself in personal development, personal growth, because the truth is this, as you grow yourself and you expand your knowledge and skills, automatically, you'll be able to grow the level of solutions that you're able to bring. So, Madam Ed, I hope I've done justice to the three panelists. I wish we had more time. I have loads of questions, but I think what we've done will suffice. Thank you again, Dr. Ola, in reverse order, Dr. Ola, Madam Yewande, thank you, and my boss, Mr. Taiwo. Thank you very much. Ed, over to you. Thank you very much to our president. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Max. Uh, that was very well moderated. And um, before I say thank you, I have to note that please, all our alumni committee members, please don't go. While we're rounding up the Q&A session, we have some other exciting updates that we need to share with you. So please, 
um, this is it's important. We've talked about identifying opportunities, talking about opportunities, and even also the value of the group and the association that we have. So please do stay on and don't go. Um, thank you so much to all our three guest speakers. Thank you for providing uh, the perspectives to all the different elements that we've asked you to speak on in very high level ways, but also in very easy and very practical ways. Um, I, I want to emphasize one of the things that uh, Ms. Sadiku said, that we're, there's a lot of information. So this was just supposed to provide a high level perspective. And one of the things that this conversation also helps, and like we've done in previous sessions, it's that it also helps us and the Alumni Exco also better plan workshops and, and much more hands-on sessions that we'll do over the, couple of, the next couple of months. And there are quite a lot of um, low hanging, hanging program, low hanging fruits that we can easily take and transform into the programs that we've done. So um, starting again from the first to the last, um, thank you very much, Taiwa Yodele. Thank you so, thank, thank you very much, Taiwa Yodele. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing. Um, I've received your slides and with your permission, um, if that's okay, we will share it with, uh, with, uh, with everyone who has registered, if that's fine. But thank yeah, you very much. We really, we really do appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to my big sister, Miss Yewande Sadiku, um, for your time, for sharing, for emphasizing quite a lot of key things uh, for me, which I think are very pertinent. Sometimes we always look to experts for information and resources, but we also have to learn to do the work ourselves. Um, you also showed and presented quite a lot of perspectives and also opportunities that we that we can also do from a practical perspective to also take advantage of some of these new opportunities with the new agreements that we're seeing. Uh, we definitely will see if there's a way that we can also now work with the NIPC, either with ourselves, some of the trade groups that we also partners are members on and for whichever um, levels of our businesses that uh, this is appropriate for. But thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Ms. Adikun. And thank you me for having me. You're, you're welcome. Thank you very much. You're excused now. And to, um, and to Dr. Ola Brown, thank you so much um, for your time. As always, this is your second time with us, I think in two or three years. And as always, you've made it very practical. You've made it relevant. You've given us, it's like you come and you do like teaching classes. You come and you give us additional work to do. Um, and that's also part of the journey of the learning and the journey of the experience. Uh, because whatever business that we decide to do, the more we know about them, the more we understand the numbers that drive the sector, the industry, and the market, the more strategic and targeted we are in terms of defining the decisions uh, that we make for ourselves and our businesses. So Dr. Ola, thank you so much as always. We appreciate your time. Uh, you're excused and we wish you um, a good afternoon and, and enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you. And so I'm going to hand over to Fatai Olayemi, the head of our growth services and alumni support. So um, at this point, we're asking alumni members to please stay on the call. We just have about 15 to 20 minutes of additional updates and we want to share a few things uh, along with our EXCO uh, with us. So Fatai, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Adenike. Um, and I want, <clears throat> I want to say thank you to all our alumni all participants of today's program. It's been a great experience with everyone today. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, now we want to talk about um, alumni activities. Of course, at FAITH, what, what we do all the time is to find a way to support our entrepreneurs. Um, 2020 <laughs> was a great year. Uh, 2021, of course, what happened in 2020 um, is still extended to 2021. And it is our strong belief that we need to continue to be resilient. Uh, we need to build you know, that high resilience in our businesses to be able to survive the effect of COVID-19 uh, on our various businesses. Of course, um, we do have alumni executives. Um, and to do justice to what activities do we have for our entrepreneurs in 2021, I won't be the one to talk about them. Um, I would like to call on our president, who is going to be calling our 
ex ex executive members one, one after the other to talk about some activities of faith in 2021 and if along the line i still need to talk about a few things i will still come back to talk about it but at this time um i would like to call on the president uh who like i said will be calling on our executives who are here present to, to talk about faith activities for 2021 my powerful president always active over to you please Thank you very much, Mr. Fatai. Uh, thank you. So hello, everyone. Uh, back here again. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So this segment here now, we have to just talk about some of the things that are upcoming um, that we, the Expo, that are charged with looking after your, your interest and representing you uh, in programs and other things. We're going to talk about some of the things that we have. Now, it's not just me. I'm fortunate as president to lead um, a team of very talented, very dedicated, hardworking people. And they come from diverse backgrounds. Um, usually, most of the time, they are quite silent because I appear to be the face. But everything we do is, is, is jointly crafted and discussed um, and agreed on before we, we act. So what we're going to do in this segment is we're going to have about three of us, three of my, my fellow EXPO members, who are going to come up and then they're going to just speak about some of the aspects of what the, the alumni would be seeing or experiencing in this 2021. So I'd like to, in no particular order, I'd like to see if uh, Madam Exec PR, Madam Clara, are you, are you with us? Could you unmute yourself, please? And if you can go to your video, could you come on? And uh, if, if you're not quite yet ready, then maybe Madam Barua, could you please? Executive Treasurer, could you please come on? Okay, I think I think uh, Madam Clara is is up. Okay, Madam Clara, so I'll mute myself. Hello, Kadi. Then... Hello, good morning. Yes, we can hear you. You can go ahead, please. The All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Clara Okoro. I'm sorry. Um, like I did mention earlier, I'm not in the office right now to make this presentation, but I'll just quickly take over and do the beats um, to the best of my ability. My name is Clara Chimokoro, Brandwell TV, an alumni of Faith Foundation. And I'm making the um, presentation on the um, re-engineering of the WhatsApp group for Faith Foundation alumni. And um, I'll just give a bullet, um, you know, bullet point presentation of what I have for, um, members. So we have um, a list of Faith Foundation WhatsApp groups and proposed the group directors. It's suggested that each group is expected to have at least three suggested group directors. And has that now, the groups with at least one director is 14 groups in number. And the groups with no suggested directors is nine in number. So I'll just give a rundown of them and they go as first. Number one, agribusiness, food and beverages is headed by Edobong Akpabio, Olusan Yabakonle, Oludayo Adeniyi Adioye. For architecture, furniture and interior decoration, we have Yinka Oshobu. Arts and entertainment, we have Ekene Song Mokunye and Bumi Davis. Beauty and fashion, we have Adetola Adeboale, Tony Bakari, Abimbola Ase. For consulting and professional services, we have Monika Mosu and David Apaflo. Education, there is nobody in charge of that yet. Event management, we have Shij Shijibomi Bennett. For um, food and beverages, we have Victoria Ikimalo. For healthcare, we have Dr. Eke Uganze and Dr. Obonna. For ICT, we have Dr. Peter Obadari and Chukwemeka Fred Abata Jr. For law, we have Folake Mikadiri, Adiola Bajabia Miller. Manufacturing, paint, electricals, furniture, we have Ralph Atere. For media and advertising, we have Femi Udubemi. For nonprofit management, there is no one there yet. For oil and gas and energy, there is no one there yet. Photography and videography, 